Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the very first episode of Mondays with Mo. This is going to be my sort of retrospective looking back at my all-time favorites live commentary series. Much more casual, much more laid back, but still injected with plenty of factual information about the games we're going to be playing each and every week. Now, I want you guys to get involved with this series. So each and every week as a new episode airs, you'll have the opportunity during that episode by clicking on the annotation in the top right corner of the screen to vote from one of three games that I could then end up playing for the following Monday's episode of Mondays with Mo. In fact, there's three games up there right now. You can vote on any one of those. The game with the most votes will be the one we feature next Monday. I'm actually really excited about this. It's going to be sort of a compliment to all of the more hardcore edited shorter videos I'm doing with the Letters from Gaming series and the Game Preview series. And I'm slowly going to be baking in more content like this as I develop the ideas and figure out the best way to execute them. Because I do want to build this channel into quite the variety channel here in 2018. The ultimate celebration of everything that I love about video games in as many different forms as I can possibly create as one individual person. So let's go ahead and kick things off today with 2013's Splinter Cell Blacklist. This is probably going to hit home for a lot of you guys. I know a lot of you are going to be uh, longtime Splinter Cell fanatics like myself and playing since the original, the OG Splinter Cell back on the good old days of the OG Xbox. And man, oh man, has this franchise come a long way. And I really can sit here and say that I, I honestly don't ever remember there being a bad entry in the Splinter Cell franchise. Double Agent probably wasn't my favorite, but I think that game actually had a really compelling, intense story. And it seems like each and every Splinter Cell, since the original, since Pandora, Chaos Theory, Double Agent, Conviction, and Blacklist, has in some way managed to slightly re 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 reinvent itself. And I think that makes the franchise kind of special. So let's go ahead and hop into a mission here. Nothing special. I'm just a little bit of a ways into the game. I haven't really played more than, I think, two or three missions. So we're going to go ahead and actually replay. I think this is like the second or third mission, the Insurgent Stronghold, just because it's hard enough for me to pay attention playing Splinter Cell when I'm not talking to people, let alone when I am playing to people. So hopefully we can pull this off with uh, without too much chaos. I'd like to at least make the game look as good as it actually is. You know, it's not an easy thing to do in Splinter Cell. But hey, look who showed up. It's it's Adam Jensen, a.k.a. Andre Coben. Let's go ahead and actually skip through most of this. We are going to take a look at a couple sections in the game where we get to see some of the acting and the storytelling and the, you know, the characters, but that's not one of them we're going to worry about. Now, of course, we can play the game on multiple difficulty options. We've got Rookie, Normal, Realistic, and Perfectionist. We're going to go with Realistic here I need to be on the ground as soon and uh, go ahead and get into the game's loadout screen. Now, I will admit, a lot of reviews uh, praise Blacklist. Blacklist got, you know, just really critical acclaim. It was a really well-reviewed game. Ubisoft didn't think so because apparently like $2 million in profit wasn't enough for them. 2013 is definitely around the time where things, I think, started to go really south in terms of how publishers were looking at their games. And it was like, if you didn't sell $30 million in profits, your game wasn't worth it. And we kind of just saw the middle market evaporate. This idea that, you know, certain genres just weren't allowed to exist because the publishers deemed them so. And I think what we saw with Splinter Cell and the sort of disappearance of this franchise and even uh, Ghost Recon eventually definitely has a lot to do with that. But nonetheless, one of the things that a lot of people said in the reviews of the game was a lack of difficulty. And I will say, even on Perfectionist, this game can become quite easy. Number one, if you focus on stealth. But number two, because we had so many ways in which we could modify our op suit. This is basically the ability to build a suit that's purely for stealth. So you could come in here and just right away get like, you know, the tactical mesh, nanopolymer coating. Obviously you had to progress in the game and earn cash to do these things. You didn't have just a big boatload of cash like I do for whatever reason. I honestly don't know why I have so much money. I've never really even played this game on PC, but I do. We could just go in here, we could buy all this stuff. We could buy tactical mesh, the nanopolymer, and just instantly give ourselves extremely low noise movement. And that would inherently make the game a bit easier. The same thing can be said for upgrading your weapons and your gadgets. But I actually liked this because I always viewed it as sort of optional difficulty. One of the things that the speedrunning community does extremely well is they come up with ways to make the game harder for specific runs, like running a 100% run with glitch lists, for example, or having to obtain a certain item in the game that is very hard to obtain. It's something that we should all do more often in our standard playthroughs, and it's something that a lot more games are starting to encourage, or at least games 
that recognize the power of encouraging these things like Dishonored and Prey, Thief even. These are all games that gave you all these different ways to modify the difficulty while also saying, hey, don't forget to play how you want to play to make the game as easy or as hard as you want. And that was the same thing here. If you wanted to, you could do a no suit upgrade run and just have the default suit the whole way through. And hell yeah, that would make the game a lot harder. But at the same time, if you were someone who wanted to go full Panther and just kill everything, you could upgrade and get your vector or decked out your FAMAS with a suppressor, or go with your SR-25, or go loud with your M10 and just slaughter everything. There was a lot of different ways you could play this Splinter Cell, and I always loved that. So let's go ahead and bounce into our Insurgent Stronghold here. One thing that Blacklist did, and that Conviction did, was have a lot more of these set pieces. You know, they, they took the sort of tried-and-true stealth formula, they added a lot of action in with Conviction. They maintained that level of optional action here in Blacklist. And then they started doing all these cinematic set pieces, which, you know what? I was always okay with. They never really felt like they detracted from the experience. They weren't there to remove uh, portions of the gameplay from the player. They were just there to kind of open up the scene and, and set the stage. They actually work really well as cinematic set pieces and, and not much else. And I always dug that. Go ahead and drop this guy as he goes around the rock. I'm just going to go ahead and quickly tag these two guys. You actually get a lot of leeway with this thing. I did get marked there, unfortunately. That's okay. Oh, what? Well, no. I was wrong. <laughs> I thought I got a little bit more leeway there. We totally screwed that up. I'm actually happy to have failed that. All right. Let's go ahead and drop this guy. I'd like to get this guy in the back ASAP. There we go. That's that's how you do the quick run there. That's the speed runner. <laughs> No, I didn't. this guy found me. Oh my, dude, I've run this mission four times now, guys, to try and just get things. There we go. Silky smooth and quick, just the way I like it. <laughs> to fail that was way too funny, but I'm kind of glad we did. Okay, let's get this guy in the distance. We're using a pretty elite sniper rifle, so they do give you a bit of leeway in the shots, but not that much, actually. It's a little bit deceptive in, in terms of how much you think you can miss, but you really do actually have to shoot those guys directly. And there we go. Now we get to jump in with uh, Sam Fisher. Now, one of the incredible things that I think they managed to do with the franchise pretty much since day one was make it very feature-rich, man. You know, in a time and period when we're getting games with less and less content that are getting rushed out, uh, out the door more quickly and then bits and pieces are being reintroduced into the game later as DLC Blacklist conviction even double agent had an insane amount of content for $60 right out the door. I'm talking Full-on single-player campaign separate co-op campaign conviction, you know with Kestrel and uh, I can never remember the other agents name full just separate campaign this one has a bunch of co-op missions that are all uh, tied to Briggs and Sam compete, you know playing the game together there's just so many different ways to play, and then Spies and Mercs came back with Blacklist, and that was a huge deal, man. This game is still to this day, if you can pick this game up, it is the most feature, content-rich experience you can buy, in my opinion, especially for this type of an experience, and it's, it's just worth every penny. If they were still charging $60 for this game, I'd completely understand it, and I would still tell people to buy it. It really is just that good, man. Not, not something we get a lot of uh, anymore, unfortunately. And that's honestly where I'll, I'll, I'll always put my foot down with the whole game should cost more argument. I'm okay with games costing more if we go back to a point in time when uh, publishers aren't finding new ways to nickel and dime us for every piece of content that, you know, could have been ready at launch pretty much day one. But let's go ahead and whip our way up here. And uh, let's actually talk a little bit more about Sam Fisher himself here in Blacklist because that was actually a pretty controversial thing, believe it or not. This is the first time that Michael Ironside isn't taking on the role of Sam Fisher. Now, there are a lot of different rumors, a lot of different opinions as to why that went down the way it went down. The sort of final word from Ubisoft and even Michael Ironside was everything to do with motion capture. So they wanted to motion capture everything Sam Fisher did, and therefore they wanted the motion capture actor to be the voice actor. Michael Ironside, getting on an age, even came out and said, like, I can't, I can't do these things. I can't do these things anymore. I'm just not in that physical shape. And he would actually stay on the project to sort of guide Eric Johnson, who would, uh, who would be replacing him and kind of help him take on the role of Sam Fisher. And I think he did a good job. Yeah, it's not Michael Ironside's gritty, grovelly Sam Fisher voice that we've come to love and know. 
but it was never a reason for me to be like, I'm not buying this game boycott, you know? I don't, I don't think there was any genuine salt between Ironside and, and the rest of the project. I think he still wanted it to be successful. And I think he was, uh, you know, kind of happy and okay passing the torch on to Eric Johnson. And I think Eric Johnson did a good job. It definitely puts Sam in, in the weird conundrum of, like, people who somehow get younger as they get older. But, eh, I'm all right with it. Let's just go ahead and actually sneak past this last guy here. I'm not even going to bother with these dudes. I'll be honest, I haven't used the crossbow in this game in forever, so I don't even remember how it works. I think we've got chaff on right now. If we go ahead and bring up our D-pad menu here, we can kind of take a look at the things we've got going on. There we go. Sticky shocker, noisemaker, EMP chaff. So that's really more of a it's more of a tool than anything. So we're going to be better off carrying around our uh, PX4 storm here. Let's go ahead and open this door. I always loved the fact that we had a lethal and non-lethal toggle mode in this game. So rather than having to make a last-second decision before you come up behind an enemy like you would in, say, Deus Ex, Mankind Divided, or Human Revolution, you can just kind of constantly be in non-lethal or lethal mode, which is nice. And that's, of course, what Blacklist was all about. It was all about player choice. How do you want to play the game? You want to be pure, raw stealth and not take out anyone or touch anyone? Do you want to go panther and be fast but silent and deadly? Or do you want to just be a maniac and just shoot up the place with with a shotgun and an assault rifle and, and, and call it a day? That player choice was always a glorious introduction into a franchise that for a long time was driven by stealth-focused gameplay. You know, It was their way of evolving Splinter Cell, and I think they always did a good job with it. But... Let's go ahead and listen and hear what this guy's got to say. Intel acquired. And now we've got our match. I'm actually going to try and mark as many of these guys as I possibly can with this drone. I think that's all we can match, and then we're going to go to the signal. <laughs> sure thing, dude. Let's get in there and take these guys out. All right, I'm going to try and sneak through as much of this as I can without causing too much trouble here. Go ahead and use our cover-to-cover -cover swap system. You know, this is still a really good-looking game. I find it crazy that a lot of critics at the time actually kind of put this game on blast for its outdated visuals. I know on the Xbox 360 and on the PlayStation, it obviously didn't look as, uh, as glorious as it does here, maxed out on PC, but... Those consoles were getting outdated, man. You know, this is Unreal Engine 2.5, actually. We're on Unreal Engine 4 now. You know, the game uh, the game went through probably a tough time to get it to look as good as it did and to have it still run smooth. And I think that was probably the team's biggest concern was we need this to run smooth. We want this to be a game that has a good, solid frame rate because that stuff matters in a game like this. And I think they delivered that on the Xbox 360. That's actually where I spent most of my time playing the franchise uh, as a whole was the Xbox. I didn't really play much of it on PC. I think I played a little bit of Double Agent on PC, and I played Blacklist on PC after the fact, but my first multiple playthroughs in co-op and single player were on the Xbox 360, and the game always performed, and I think it looked great considering the technology of that console at that time, but here we go. We get to see Eric Johnson's performance as the brutal and much more wise and old Sam Fisher. A lot less patience. Just, just uh, abusive, man. I don't think the guy even got a chance to say anything yet. <laughs> you know, the one thing that this franchise did really well, and this harkens back to OG Splinter Cell and the fact that Tom Clancy was so involved in the project, is it always felt like a just a hardcore, military, political, tense thriller, you know? I love that stuff, man. Hunt for Red October... You know, just Jack Ryan, everything Tom Clancy ever did, I've always been a sucker for that stuff. I haven't loved it as much when I've read the books. But man, when it's come to the translation of the writing to film and to video games in many cases, I've always felt like they've done a really good job of it. And I think Splinter Cell is sort of the pinnacle of that. Probably some of the best examples of, of that sort of storytelling, that sort of atmosphere. It's definitely got a bit more over-the-top Hollywood action-oriented. Let's go ahead and spare this guy. Uh, as time has gone on, and Blacklist is a, is a good example of that. It definitely doesn't have the same sort of grassroots <laughs> vibe that the original Splinter Cell and like Chaos Theory had, but I think they did this. Uh, they did a good job with it, man. I've always enjoyed it because of that. All right, this guy shot himself. We got to get the hell out of here now. 
let's go ahead and bop our way down here. Now, if there's one thing this game has done really well, even in Unreal Engine 2.5, is uh, is the lighting, man. I know the textures maybe aren't as glorious as they could be, and I'd, I'd love to have a modern Splinter Cell, man. I'd love to see this franchise come back, but the lighting was always on point. You know what? A game where you're hiding in the shadows, lighting matters, and they definitely killed it with this. Let's make our way up here, though. Okay, I always forget that a lot of the time in this game especially, there's sort of multiple operations going on. So you're kind of getting a glimpse of that over your comms. You're hearing everything happening with the larger teams and you're kind of existing as a part of it. The game definitely got weird in terms of its story as you transition from Conviction to Blacklist because it's like Sam's working for the government. The government's kind of betraying him and lying to him. Where's his daughter? He's furious. He's pissed. And then we're back to him like kind of working for the government but not really the government, you know, fourth echelon now. And, uh, I don't know, man, the game has gone all over its place. You know, Splinter Cell, I think, at some point decided that it, it wanted to try and match the, uh, the nonsense and the lack of linear storytelling that Metal Gear had. It's definitely not come close to that, but even as a Splinter Cell fan, the game got confusing. There's no doubt about that. Let's go ahead and sneak our way around the corner here. You know, one of the things that we should mention after that cutscene, the violence that we sort of saw there with Sam is that that was a huge part of Conviction's storyline, is that Sam is pissed now. He's furious. He's he's dealt with loss of his daughter. He doesn't know what's going on with that. In reality, his daughter would be alive, but he's just dealt with a lot of shit. And he's a, he's a bitter, a hardened man, more than he already was because of that. And he is so violent. Conviction was advertised in that way, and the player got to actually experience a game like that because he just went around crushing everybody's faces into toilets. It was brutal, man kind of shimmy here i don't know if this guy's gonna get up and let's go ahead and throw a mark on him this is actually a pretty populated area of the map if i remember so if we can get this guy silently let's you know what let's sneak around the back door here instead we should be able to use cover of the box here there we go that's what i want to see i do want to kind of be cautious here let's look at our tool set again we've got the sticky shocker on the crossbow right which is super useful so that's that's basically what we're going to use to knock dudes out here i believe We got a point towards execute there. I'm gonna get back into our pistol though. Still want to be cautious. I think we got quite a few dudes here. This is this is basically the Splinter Cell experience, right? I mean, even Metal Gear, any of these sort of stealth action games, they really all revolved around developing a knowledge for the mission. So you'd play through on one on one run and fail miserably, and then on the second one, you'd have a better understanding for every where everything was and where everybody was and how you wanted to sort of execute your route. And that, that's where a lot of the, the replayability for these games came from. Being able to come back into this then and decide, okay, well, I'm going to play more aggressive this time. I'm going to go faster, but I'm going to stay quiet. I always, I always just love that about Splinter Cell. Replayability on a whole other level, man. Let's quickly get around the corner here. All right, so we got one, two, three, four guys right in this immediate area. We're going to have to try and take down those two guys. I'm thinking it would be great to do that with a mark and execute, but we got that fourth guy hanging out on the bridge then, and he's going to cause a bit of a problem. If this guy comes over this way, maybe we can make him come over this way with a bit of a noisemaker. What do I got weapons-wise here? Let's see. Noisemaker. Let's fire the noisemaker into the corner there. Should be enough to get this guy's attention. And as he sweeps past us, go ahead and drop him. Without them seeing us. And there we go. We should be able to make use of our mark and execute on these two dudes now. As long as we can line them up, bada-boom. Bada bing. We got one more guy on that bridge, but I think we might be able to just let him slide. Oh, wait. You know what? He's coming back. Let's actually go clean him up. You never you never know, man. He could, like, trigger the alarm or something. Oh, crap. He's got armor on. All right. We got to be careful now because there are actually... Multiple dudes in the uh, in the sort of camp here, if I remember correctly, inside. We just kind of... Yeah, there we go. We screwed that up. They don't even know where I am, but they're like... Probably a good time to switch to our MP7, if I'm honest. There we go. All right. 
didn't, didn't go as planned. Typical, typical Splinter Cell fashion. Oh, we got a heavy. We got a heavy, guys. That's that's the end of us. There we go, and we wipe just like that. I'm under the bridge leading to the village. The game may not have been hard enough for the diehards, but trust me, there's some difficulty we had here. Let's see if we can make our way through this a little bit faster this time, and uh, see what we come out on top with. Damn, dude, that was unfortunate. I didn't, I didn't really want to mess that up. I don't want to mess that up. That's close. You can see, even as we're just crouch walking, how uh, easy it is to actually get spotted by the enemies. And that, again, is a big part of having to upgrade your suit, which is why, if you really did want that optional difficulty, you could just go ahead and never upgrade your suit, man. It would make the game a hell of a lot harder, especially time goes on, and you actually get to points in the game where it's, like, extremely challenging. What do we got on here? We got the Noisemaker. We've got the wrong thing equipped, ladies and gentlemen. Sticky Shocker. Away. All right, let's try and do this a little bit better this time, shall we? All because we we weren't able to actually hit that guy in the head like we were supposed to. What a what a massive fail on that one, man. That was uh that was slightly embarrassing. Okay, here we go. Take him out over the cover. But a boom, bada bang. That was good timing. That's how we want to do it. That's a big part of really learning the levels, right? And this is, man, this is so much the type of game I'd love to see some people speedrun. The way speedrunners optimize for for any game, I think, would be incredible to see how they would do it here in Splinter Cell. Just getting enemy rotations flawlessly and, you know, trying to take people out exactly when they need to. To get the best possible times. I love that stuff, man. I love it. Let's go ahead and pop and execute on these two guys. Now this time, the guy at the end of the bridge is going to get left alone. Because we should actually, if he's walking that way, we should be able to make it through here, clear it out, without having to worry too much about him. So that's what we're going to ride on. You can actually hear just how much noise we make with our footsteps. <laughs> that's how noisy we actually are, man. Sam Fisher left his good boots back in, uh, back in New York City, back at home. Make our way on over. Now, you know, we talked a little bit earlier, just to hit on the history of this game a little bit more, about how this was uh, Ubisoft Toronto's very first official game. They had actually been a studio since 2009, this game coming out in 2013, and they had been doing sort of other work for Ubisoft. But the director, who would then end up working on Blacklist, was actually the same guy who worked on Conviction. So that's Maxime uh, Belland. He was actually... He was the head director, the game director on Conviction, and he would basically go to Toronto uh, to work at Ubisoft Toronto as a new studio, and they would be put to work on their first like official Splinter Cell game. So that's always one of the most interesting things, I think, about Ubisoft games as a whole is just how many different Ubisoft studios there are, how many different people end up directing these games, working on them. Like, there really isn't one Ubisoft franchise that's been around for more than, you know, like five years that has just one team assigned to its success or to its creation it's almost always multiple teams across many years many different studios many different people designers artists so on and so forth and i've always actually thought that was a really a really cool thing you know when we talk about just the diversity behind the group of people that have, that have put these games together this guy's doing oh man that's how fast you die though with no armor that's it done i hope we got a checkpoint i really actually want to try and finish this entire mission uh with this commentary today it'll probably push us into the 30 minute mark but hopefully you guys enjoy this sort of thing and of course as, as time goes on you know if you guys want to see like a face cam for this you got any like feedback as to how you'd like to see it presented feel free to let me know down in the comment section i know that 20 minute videos 30 minute videos 40 minute videos aren't for everyone but that's kind of the point like i want to throw some variety into the channel you know, and make sure that there's a, there's something there for everyone. You don't have to come back, you know, every single video and, and, and necessarily have something that you're interested in. There can be a bit of everything here. That's that's the that's the point I'm going for. That's the direction I'm trying to take things anyways. So. All right, we took that guy out. 
You can hear, they can just hear me from like a mile away, man. I think this guy's right below us. There he is. Let's actually mark that dude if we can. All right, perfect. So we're going to want to take that guy out and sneak around that right side. That'll probably be our best bet of making it through here unseen. Especially now that he has identified this guy. So let's wait for him to go check the body. I'm actually going to sprint off cover and rush him down before he shoots. Get our execute up. Oh, second guy. That was unexpected, but uh, <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. We made it through. Don't worry about it. Not a, not a thing to worry about. There we go. Now we got this guy over here. I always, what I would do on my playthroughs, I think after the first playthrough I did with the game and all the co-op I played with my brother, I would actually uh, just equip, just level up my stealth enough that I could walk up behind people at crouch walk speed at full without having to do this, but no more than that to keep the difficulty going. That was probably some of my favorite playthroughs with the game. I never went full stealth kit on this. This is actually probably the Splinter Cell game I've replayed the most, especially in co-op. The co-op in this game is unbelievable, man. This and Conviction have some untouchably good co-op experiences. In reality, probably some of the only, you know, sort of stealth action co-op experiences on the market. I can't really think of any other games that have uh, successfully pulled that sort of thing off, at least not to this production level. It's one of the things I always wanted Metal Gear to have was like a really hardcore, badass co-op mode i always just felt like co-op with like you know raiden and, and and snake would just be unbelievable man but we're getting towards the end of this mission now the missions in this game also i think scaled really well in terms of their actual difficulty in terms of the level design that's probably one of the best things about blacklist is just how well the levels themselves are designed and as time goes on the difficulty scales up naturally with the complexity of the levels and the enemies that you go up against so now you do end up going up against uh, more heavily armored enemy types, like the one guy that we met in the tunnel there, the smoke does, who can't be dropped with like a sticky charge or can't be dropped with one headshot. This is this is a game that I think deserves to be put on my list of need to do letters for, from gaming because a retrospective for the franchise as a whole. And I think for what Blacklist did, a lot of it that I think was really overlooked and, and underrated in a lot of ways, or at least underappreciated. Uh, is something that I think deserves its own discussion, undoubtedly. But let's figure out how the hell we're going to get through here. We could noisemaker these guys, and I'm thinking maybe that's what we'll go for with the uh, bow here. Just try and get their attention elsewhere while we shift around the map a little bit. Let's hit that telephone pole. We've got two executes right now, so we can execute up to two guys. I'm going to go ahead and, and bum rush this in about a second. Go, 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 go. Okay, there we go. Take this guy. I'm going to go for the high ground here now. So one, two. We still got three, four targets in the area, which is making things difficult. There's a good chance somebody's going to go around the back of the building and identify that one guy too, but we're going to kind of just hold out here and, and, and uh, see what we can do. Ideally, if we can isolate, if we can get this guy and this guy up there down. We don't technically have to take everyone out here either. We could just sneak through here. It's really a matter of how we want to play it. In a perfect world, we could make it away across the top there, but don't think that's going to happen. This is actually kind of a difficult situation. We don't want to drop any one of these guys and sort of alert everyone else. I think one guy's actually in the building with us down below. This guy just keeps doing like the same patrol route over and over again, which is really starting to irritate me, if I'm honest. All right, let's pop this guy. I think he's actually out of sight to the point we'll be all right. This guy to the right went way out. We can totally pop him as well. We can just get good positioning here to do so. Boom. Done. All right. This guy out. Ideally, in a perfect world, we would have marked that guy up top and took him out as well. But we're going to go with this and just get the hell out of here. <laughs> Sometimes you fail and you just got to book it because you know what? You're Sam Fisher and you don't got all day to explain why you didn't execute that perfectly. <laughs> all right. It worked out well enough. I love what they did with the little touches of the text here. That was something Conviction did, and they carried it over here, and I always just thought they did a stellar job with that. This game also, when we get back to the uh, to the plane, or while we were at the plane, you guys might have saw, like, 
sort of the alternative missions that were showing up there. This game was one of the first, uh, it was one of the, I think it was one of a few. I'm trying to remember what other games around that time did a lot of this, but basically Ubisoft started doing all these daily mission timers. It's something that Wildlands actually does really well. Like if you avidly play Wildlands every weekend with your friends, there's always new missions being, you know, sort of created for you to enjoy and Blacklist did the exact same thing. Co-op and single-player missions. Constantly updated missions that give you currency and credits to upgrade your kit. Unfortunately, it's a part of the movement called Games as a Service, which I think originally could have had good intentions, but has led to what we see much of today. But nonetheless, I think cool. I like stuff like that. I like the idea that if you're someone still playing this game, even solo, just every now and then, there's more content basically being pumped into the game for you free of charge. We need more goodness like that. Left a tablet behind. You did all right, Eric Johnson. You did all right, my friend. If they bring back Sam Fisher, I would gladly have Eric Johnson return as him. Although you wonder, how could they bring back Sam Fisher? And you know what? I'll be honest. I think that they could bring back Splinter Cell without Sam Fisher. I know that sounds crazy and that the diehard fans would go wah wah about it all day long, but I consider myself a diehard fan. And I would love to see characters like Kestrel return, you know? Like, bring back the co-op characters from Conviction. There's just, there's so many stories you could tell behind Third Echelon and Fourth Echelon and all of the different parts of the Splinter Cell life, if you will, that have existed throughout the history of Splinter Cell. It, it's got a pretty rich background lore, or at least, you know, it has a universe that could be greatly expanded. There we go, though. We definitely got Ghost on that. 550 efficiency, not the best. Nine hostiles undisturbed. 175 realistic stealth knockouts. And we do get a little bit of panther in there. Not too much, though. Almost no assault, which is great. The later missions become pretty hardcore to the point where you almost end up going full panther all the time if you're not really skilled. But that's just kind of how the game sort of plays out. I've always appreciated that about it. There you have it, though, guys. Thank you all so very much for joining me for this first episode of Mondays with Mo. Again, this is really the direction I'm trying to take this style of video. I want it to be casual, live commentary, throw in some bits and pieces of information there. Just get some discussion flowing about games from the past, even if it was the very near past or, you know, something very far away. So once again, do me a huge favor. If you like this series, let me know down in the comment section below if you're looking forward to seeing more of it. We're going to keep rocking and rolling on this for... Hopefully all of 2018. You know, this is just something I'm going to embrace. I've got new ideas. I'm not going to be super concerned with how well they perform initially. We're just going to keep doing them, trying to bring an audience in that likes this. And, of course, if you like shorter, more hardcore edited content, check out my Letters from Gaming. Check out my game previews. If you haven't already seen Chasing Relevancy, that's a video that I'm really proud of. Go ahead and check that out. And be sure to cast your vote. The annotation is in the top right corner of the screen. Click that little I button. And uh, let me know what game you want to see me feature in next Monday's episode of Mondays with Mo. And, of course, if you want to lament your your sorrow and, and talk about how much you miss the Splinter Cell franchise, feel free to do that down in the comments section below. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.